Hello, my name is Larry Pearson, Vice President of Marketing at Impetus Technologies, and I will be your host and MC for today's webinar entitled Automated Migration from On-Premise Hadoop to Databricks and Data Lake Using Impetus Stream Analytics. Uh, we do lots of webinars, many of you in our audience today, and by the way, there are over 100 companies uh, represented uh, on this webinar may be familiar with Impetus already. For those of you who are not, I thought I would just take one minute and tell you a little bit about the fact that we, are, we have been specialized on the topic of enterprise advanced analytics and now cloud migration for over 23 years based here in the U.S. Uh, you see here on the screen uh, what might be viewed as a mission statement enabling a unified, clear, and present view of your business, what is commonly referred to as a single source of truth. And we provide solutions, services, uh, software products to guide the entire end-to-end -end journey from automated assessment all the way through to deployment, to validation, deployment, production, and post-production uh, DevOps. Uh, here's an agenda. I'd like to just take a minute to take you through an agenda for our meeting today. We're going to begin by talking about um, the status of uh, cloud, cloud adoption. Uh, in the enterprises, we work with uh, a number of large enterprises and have for many, many years now. Following that, we'll talk about an overview and introduction to Databricks and Delta Lake, uh, and then Stream Analytics uh, overview, which is the impetus product, followed by a real-world use case, a demonstration, and then finally, uh, a Q&A. Another way that we add some in level of interactivity is with polls. And so you'll see appearing on your screen here uh, shortly uh, the first poll. And would encourage you to respond to that. That poll will be open for 15 minutes. And uh, you can enter your response there at any time. And we'll come back to you 15 minutes from now and share with you the feedback from the audience on the poll that says, what are your main concerns while moving conventional ETL tools, which is one of the real-life examples that we'll be focusing on today to a modern architecture, uh, choose all that apply from cost, time and effort to migrate, ease of use, skill set, and other. So again, invite you to do that along with entering your, uh, your questions. Also, I uh, would encourage you to uh, view the presentation in full screen mode. We will be doing a live demo, and it will be much uh, clearer when you get to those screenshots and uh, charts and graphs and things. Um, a brief introduction of our speakers today. Uh, first with me is Anand Venu Gopal. Anand is Director of Industry Solutions at Databricks. He has more than 20 years of software innovation and business development experience in the enterprise space and is particularly passionate about solutions based on uh, open source technology stacks. Also with him is Puneet Shaw from Impetus. Puneet is Director of Engineering for Stream Analytics and he leads and has, has been uh, a key member of the core team that developed uh, Stream Analytics and has continued to be involved uh, with leading implementations, customer engagements, and, uh, and managing the product engineering team uh, with regard to the roadmap for Stream Analytics. So uh, Anand and Puneet, thank you for being with us uh, today. The whole question, and, and this is apparent, I'm sure, to many of you who are living this out or you wouldn't be on our webinar today, really has to do with the fact that the move to the cloud is now an undeniable and really unstoppable uh, move, and it's, it's driven off of a variety of forces. You see three quotes here from Forbes, two from Gartner, and again, no surprise to all of you uh, because you're in all likelihood in the middle of uh, some stage uh, at some point in the journey from the enterprise data warehousing environment moving toward implementation of data lakes and advanced analytics uh, on the cloud. Let's just take a minute and talk about some of the uh, characteristics of the enterprise uh, data warehousing environment that have caused uh, companies to be interested in the cloud and driving this huge, as I like to call it, unstoppable move to the cloud. And number one, they are burdened by the explosion of uh, data sources and demand for more and better insights across the enterprise. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through today's webinar, and in particular the demand for 
advanced analytics and, uh, and self-service. In, in doing that, um, inside of the infrastructure available traditionally in the enterprise data warehouse environment, we specifically experience uh, capacity constraints. We're burdened by the explosion of data sources and data types, and, uh, and this has led to a slowing of adoption for companies that have not had uh, strategies in place and moving forward in their implementation. These are some of the key motivations. Um, in addition, as they look at the cloud in comparison to the enterprise data warehouse infrastructure environment, obviously it offers the uh, opportunity for infinite capacity and scalability, the elasticity to handle a range of, uh, of workloads, and the opportunity to run on lower cost uh, commodity uh, infrastructure. So you see all of those things listed here. Clearly, the plethora of uh, unstructured and, and semi-structured data sources and the ability to meet the demand for self-service uh, BI data anal advanced analytics uh, and in, in a, in a self-service environment, which is where we as uh, enterprises want to get to, all of those are attractive uh, uh, reasons why this move to the cloud has become such a huge stampede. Uh, but at the same time, all of that is not without without challenges. And I'd like to ask Anand Venu Gopal now to weigh in and share some of his experiences in dealing with the challenges of this journey from the enterprise environment to the cloud now uh, for the future. Anand, over to you. Good morning, good evening to those of you who are joining this both live as well as in a recording mode. Pleasure to be here. Um, 24 years of industry experience from my side, and most relevant part is that I'm actually in Databricks, uh, leading the global migrations program, working with some of these, you know, the largest customers in the world, pretty much who are moving from their Hadoop uh, clusters and investments and all the surrounding tool sets they have, uh, the data warehouse technologies that they've invested into and, and have a pretty deep commitment flowing all the way from the top to move to the cloud. You know, the largest retail companies, the largest banks, the largest telecom companies, insurance companies, healthcare. Uh, we have thankfully surmounted over all of the uh, fundamental security concerns, the, the data privacy concerns, and all, all of that has been addressed to even the most regulated industries are now moving over. And the challenges that people are trying to avoid and try, trying to uh, move away from is, is pretty much one of the key, key things that Larry mentioned, which is uh, the, the DevOps and uh, maintenance burden of this infrastructure on-prem is just way too much, and it, it literally prevents them from moving into the future. People are moving to the future, and the scenarios like AI-driven bots and uh, voice-driven customer experiences, um, you know, uh, the pervasive IoT that's going to be all around us, the kind of data flow that that brings in, and the analytics that's needed, none of that is absolute is, is even possible or even imaginable at this at at that scale with the on-premise infrastructure now that we have. So it's literally the biggest, I would say, the biggest reason that people are moving is to be is to be future ready. Uh, they have realized that you know while Hadoop et cetera was uh, was good in its time. It was a great move from the it was a great move from the data warehouse days to the data lake days, but the data lake did not provide what they needed in terms of uh, you know you know ease ease of use and uh, uh, performance and reliability. So they're now moving to the cloud and experiencing that. And it is we are all lucky in this industry to be in the midst of this life once in a lifetime IT transformation is what I would say. Um, and it's just a joy to be here, and it's just a joy to relieve customers from their, the burden that they're experiencing. Uh, people are on with pagers on the weekends. They say 80% of their time is done, is spent doing things doing that they would rather not do in terms of just infrastructure maintenance as opposed to doing application-related work and use cases-related work. So we're, we're uh, very, very happy to be here uh, with, uh, with our partner here, Impetus, and to take all of these companies forward into the future. And uh, here's an example of all of the uh, the companies and the industries that are actually moving 
from on-premise to the cloud, and these are all actually customers of Databricks, um, with, without doing too much of a you know sales pitch here, it's obvious how all of these companies touch our lives and uh, and how our lives are becoming better, especially with, I mean, look around us at this in this time of COVID-19, right? The amount of work from home that is now happening across the board, would this happen if we have extreme reliance on just, if, imagine if all the infrastructure was just on-prem, right? Could we have just remotized ourselves um, and, and been as productive? You know, I've been working from home from 1st of March. I shut down travel. Uh, and it's simply because of this new model of working that we're able to do all of this and still continue to be productive. Now, specifically, what are people moving away from, right? There are two investments that they've made over, over the years, data warehouse and data lake. Uh, and each of these have their own challenges. And people are looking at, you know, massive renewals of 5, 10, 15, 20 million dollars on their data warehouse appliances that they're trying to get their ETL loads off of. On the data lake side, they're trying to, again, very similarly move, move away from the Hadoop infrastructure that they've been tied down to, uh, the surrounding ETL uh, investments that they're trying to move away from and then relocate into the cloud. Uh, the cost, the flexibility, the lack of innovation, the complete absence of AI infrastructure, integrated AI infrastructure, like if they want to use a set of GPUs for some use case, uh, they're not able to integrate that in one environment. They have to move data, tens of terabytes of uh, data across across these two environments. So a number of these uh, critical reasons are, are the reasons why they're all moving to the modern platforms. And Databricks, as some of you might know, I just want to give a 30, maybe 30 second overview here. We are the company that originally created Apache Spark. A lot of people know us, hey, as the Spark company, but now we are moving forward into a complete unified data and analytics platform that is accelerating innovation, that is touching the cutting border use cases of, of healthcare, of uh, IoT and predictive maintenance, of banking, et cetera. So we're really taking all of these companies that, that form, that touch our lives into, the, into their future. And the evidence has been clear. So it's, we're now, you know, six plus billion dollars in value, dramatic growth, six x growth over the last two three years in terms of value, five thousand plus customers. And one of the most important things that we are proud of and we we like to focus on is our partners. We're with a partner Impetus today, uh, who's helping to migrate workloads over to over to our Delta Lake platform. And you can see on the screen, besides the Apache Spark, we got these. Two other uh, very interesting innovations that we've continued to invest in and develop. Uh, ML Flow, it brings a level of productivity to the entire machine learning uh, life cycle, uh, which is critical because when people are trying to build a number of different models um, and, and trying to register all of the performance of each of those models, what parameters they tune, what are the optimal set of parameters that they, 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 they had with each experiment, all of that entire life cycle is now regulated and, and uh, helped to be managed by MLflow. And on Delta, which is, which is our favorite thing now in a, the combination of Spark and structured streaming and Delta, is such a powerful combination. I'll talk a little bit more about this. It's one of our uh, most recent innovations that we are proud of. We, we wanted to stick with being an open source friendly company. Apache Spark was open source. Similarly now, Delta Lake is open source. It's now managed by the Linux Foundation. Uh, so we've open sourced that. We continue to be a user of Delta Lake. We continue to add value on top of Delta Lake on the Databricks uh, platform. So with uh, with Databricks, you will have a very, very strong, optimized, highly efficient um, performance-tuned experience of Delta, of Delta Lake. And Delta Lake is by itself, of course, a technology that you can use on-prem, you can use on cloud, you can use with a number of other technologies, like uh, including Spark, Hive, Presto, et cetera. So, let me actually walk you through this because it's so relevant, and the, to the demo that Puneet and the, the Impetus Tool Stream Analytics is going to do today is going to be landing an ETL workflow onto Delta Lake and data onto Delta Lake. Uh, we see what this is about and why this is so cool and important, right? So when people moved from data lakes, uh, data warehouses to data lakes, they got this low-cost, elastic commodity hardware that they could scale with and get all their structured and unstructured data in one platform. That was great. Right, what they lost in the process is the is the reliability, and uh, of of what they used to have with uh, the data warehouse technology. Right, they could they could uh, you know the the story is is uh, they, their expectation was they've spent all of this money getting data into data lakes with Apache Spark. They wanna they wanna get data into data lakes with uh, 
structured data with unstructured data, click streams, customer data, and all of that data to analyze so that they could cre create these wonderful new insights uh, with both BI, data science, and machine learning, right? So they could build out their recommendation engines and impact the business positively. That was the aspiration. Now, what turned out in terms of the reality is that that data was not ready for analytics and machine learning. A lot of these projects we have seen, um, I, it, 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 we have seen some large banks, you know, spending thirty plus million dollars on their on their, you know, uh, local Delta Lake or local data lake environment, not Delta Lake. Sorry about that. Local data lake, uh, Hadoop-based data lake environment, and thirty thirty-five million dollar investments, many many years, many many man years of investment was just written off because of the data swamp that it became. Right, um, the unreliability is 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 just resulted in downstream analytics being useless because the data got corrupt. You got weeks and weeks of efforts that you need to recover your data and get it back to a sane state. So what is it that creates these reliability and performance issues? There are some specific challenges that people deal with, right, uh, which we solve. Now, these are as follows, right? So the, the reliability challenges are, number one, with failed production jobs. These jobs leave data corrupted and in, a, in an uh, unknown state, one of my own personal friends has been in a, in a very large payment company, um, payment-related company, is, his, in his, whole, his whole team is now recovering a, over a month their Hadoop cluster because somebody went and, uh, you know, one, but some job created a, a corruption of data and it's, they're taking that much tedious effort over weekends instead of do that recovery. It's very, very real, folks. Uh, this lack of schema enforcement creates inconsistent and low-quality data. So there is a lot of times when, especially IoT data, there's different vendors and equipment sending their data in different formats. These formats change, and now you're expecting it in a particular particular uh, schema. And uh, the lack of schema enforcement uh, creates, again, another set of problems in, in the data lake where your, your downstream analytics is expecting things in a particular format that changed, and then it, it created, created issues, right? And the other, the other problem with the lack of consistency is that reads and writes uh, and batch and streaming cannot happen at the same time. Uh, you, need, you need to do that in separate time chunks. Uh, you need to separate those things out. And again, it creates, these are massively shared resources, shared clusters with shared users and shared tenants. Uh, and that again, creates challenges. Those are reliability issues, right? The, the, the next thing is, uh, Performance challenges, right? So we, we, we've all probably people who are familiar with the with the Hadoop um, paradigm are familiar with this small file problem. So when you have especially things like a streaming uh, streaming job, you know, feeding data into your data lake, you get hundreds, sometimes millions of small files. And if you're trying to do analytics on that, you got to just run a separate compaction job. And if you're trying to do, uh, you know, reading and getting some intelligence out of it. Imagine the kind of time that it takes to open and close files. You'll end up, the, the processes end up taking much more time doing that rather than taking the data and making sense of it. And that creates, again, downstream delays. Um, partitioning is, is another issue. There's the, the lack of, uh, you know, the lack of proper indexing. So let's call it, we call it poor man's indexing, breaks down when you pick a field and then the data characteristics change and then you become extreme high cardinality on some other column, right? Um, and the lack of caching can be a big limitation, uh, especially even with, with cloud storage, with native cloud storage, the, the throughput is low. So without a caching strategy and without an intelligent read uh, strategy that would optimize your, your query response times, again, you're dealing with uh, a pretty low performance system. So that's where the, that's where the whole uh, innovation of Delta Lake came. We actually co-innovated with a, a major uh, a company, a technology provider that we are all aware of, um, but we in their security, cybersecurity uh, operation where they were offloading another uh, another product, uh, they had they had challenges. They were users of the web, they were users of the cloud, but they had these issues and they really needed to a new technology. They said, "Look, you know, we we need a solution for this." So we actually built out uh, Delta Lake in in, in uh, collaboration with that company. And now it's, of course, is open source. There's a public video of, of uh, that company speaking at the Spark, uh, Spark Summit. So it's based on Parquet. It has transaction capabilities. It has uh, compatibility with Apache Spark APIs. And that's what Puneet's going to show today. 
as well with stream analytics uh, riding into Delta Lake through Spark. Um, so it's a it's a very it's a very powerful uh, product that we that we hope that all of you will consider and, and use. So it, it solves the reliability and uh, performance problems, and people uh, world over are now using this. And I'll give you a sense of who who they are. But uh, BI, data science, machine learning is now all possible on one platform on Delta Lake, and especially in combination with Spark. Um, it's, it's, extremely, it's extremely useful. And to have all of those workloads running out of a single platform so you don't need to re replicate your data and uh, you don't use different data platforms for different use cases, right? So the specific things that you get are asset transactions, so you can actually read and write at the same time. You have consistency there. Schema enforcement is configurable. Um, you can enforce as much as you want, and unified batch and streaming jobs allow you to completely flow the data from your input to your output downstream systems. You can have two, three levels of bronze, uh, silver, gold to, to land your raw data and to have a two-step enrichment process. On, on the right side, you'll have you know, your, your data applications and your BI and your analytics consuming on the, on the right side. And the transaction log gives you the ability to actually do snapshots and, and go backwards. So imagine in a data lake today in a 100-node cluster, if you want to say, well, I want to go back to my 9 a.m. version of the data, it's simply unimaginable on a Hadoop data lake, right? So with, with uh, the facilities that you, you now have with, uh, with Delta Lake, you can actually do that. So uh, you got reliability solved, you got performance solved, which is we got indexing, we got compaction, uh, there's other couple of innovations of data skipping and caching that we use. So if you if you if there's a query uh, that results in a particular response, and if the same if the same data is hit in the next query, so we optimize that again. Something you don't get in a regular data lake. Uh, so it's both optimized for uh, reliability and super high performance. And people have seen some tremendous benefits um, with with this. And here are the companies that are actually using Delta Lake. It's open source, and we, we call ourselves a user of Databricks uh, of Delta Lake. That's why our logo is there as well. So you see, world over now, companies are jumping on. There's about three exabytes, I think, of, of data that we that we process on on Delta Lake every month. Specifically, um, Comcast came up on our Hadoop on our uh, Spark Summit, uh, and you know gave a talk of how their new voice-driven uh, remote control interaction a customer experience is, is driven by a, an analytics workflow, which which has petabyte scale jobs, and uh, they, they they were able to reduce with the combination of Databricks the Databricks runtime engine and uh, Spark and structured streaming and Delta Lake underneath were able to lower their compute from about 640 instances to 64, and uh, and, 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 and the iteration of multiple weeks would it now takes about five minutes to deploy. So both in terms of ease of use and, and uh, performance, they now have a very, very strong uh, performance and, and metrics, and there's both performance and cost savings. And another telco I'm working with has about similar similar numbers, 80x 80, 80 uh, efficiency gain. So let's come to the point of migrations, right? So we're, we're talking about here uh, migrating all of these uh, legacy workloads to, to, uh, uh, to Databricks and, and Delta Lake. It might not be as easy as it seems, right? So there's, we all know that there's, there's uh, data, there's metadata, there's security, there's, there's integrated, uh, integrated tools around your environment. So we've got to move all of that. And um, it, it's not as smooth and effective as, uh, as you might like it sometimes because of all of the risk of, of, uh, of the errors involved and the risks and, and complexity and the scale involved in these migrations. So moving petabytes, for example, of data with uh, the metadata and all of the surrounding security governance structure and the workloads is, is going to be a pretty complex project, and you really need automation. You really need to reduce that um, complexity and risk in that process to ensure that your users continue their experience with, without any interruption, right? So we believe in, in automation, in automation, bringing automation into the migration process, both the, for the Hadoop and the ETL surrounding workloads. We are investing our attention with our partners on a number of tools and methodologies and best practices frameworks. We've done a number of these. Uh, hundreds of these customers have migrated. We've, we've got the best practices. We've realized that Partnering with uh, companies like Impetus and Stream Analytics and bringing in automation into the into the process is very very critical. So we closely partner with our AWS and Azure uh, cloud partners, and we partner with tools 
and services companies. And, and Impetus Stream Analytics is a very unique combination because Stream Analytics is a, is a product as, as well coming from uh, Impetus, which is the services uh, wing of the, of the company, which is a good combination. So it's a classic example of what you're going to see today where automation of migration delivers ease of use and speed uh, in the migration process. So I'll, I'll kind of pause here um, and hand it over back to the Impetus team to take charge and show us what we have. Uh, great, Alan. Thank you for that very interesting uh, overview of the challenges and some of the ways that uh, Databricks is approaching uh, to address those. We'll now close the uh, poll, and you'll see here momentarily the poll results on your screen. Thank you again for participating in our poll. And uh, you should see those uh, here uh, momentarily. And they're appearing on your screen right now. So again, the question, the question that we were addressing uh, is what are the major challenges, your main concerns in moving to the cloud? And we see here that 87% have addressed or have uh, pointed to the matter of the time and effort to migrate uh, combined with the cost of that which, of course, as you heard Anand uh, uh, reference the need for automation, that's a big investment that we also have made it in impetus, is providing automation tools and frameworks, and you'll see some further detail on all of that here uh, momentarily. Uh, so in rank order, time and effort to migrate, cost, ease of use, skill set, and then a miscellaneous 7% uh, of other. So thank you again uh, for participating in our poll. And what I'd like to do now is ask Puneet Shaw to jump in. And uh, Puneet, if you'd uh, jump in and, and show us some of the solutions that, uh, that we have in place, which combine the power of the Databricks platform with our stream analytics tooling. Sure. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, Anand. Before I jump right into the migration aspect of the webinar, a quick overview of Stream Analytics for um, our audience who are not aware or familiar with the tool. Stream Analytics is a self-service data flow and analytics product by Impetus. We call it as a Data 360 platform. It serves all your data processing needs, whether they are batch workloads or streaming workloads. You can build all of them visually in an easy-to-use graphical interface and run it on top of Apache Spark powered by Databricks on any of the cloud providers, whether it's Azure or AWS. It also lets you build your machine learning models and execute those at enterprise scale. And alongside building and designing your workflows, it also provides you an end-to-end lifecycle management of these workloads that you would deploy. For instance, if you want to know at what rate your stream processing applications are operating at, while processing data, are they encountering any errors? What is the throughput? All those questions that are important from a DevOps perspective in order to maintain a highly available application on Spark, all of those answers are provided by Streamantics. All those metrics are captured and made available to you in a visual manner. It's a unified product. It can ingest data from any sources irrespective of the data format. It could be structured, semi-structured, unstructured, IoT data, social media feeds, uh, Evro, Parquet, XML, any kind of format of data that you have from any source, Streamatics can bring it in. And no matter who you are, whether a developer or a DevOps or a data scientist, you can use the visual interface. Even a business analyst can use the visual interface to build the ingestion platforms, data wrangling applications, machine learning algorithms at scale, and load them into an enterprise data store like Delta Lake. Now, we have done several of these kind of engagements with our partner Databricks here. Uh, we have had experiences where we have migrated a lot of customers from their on-prem Hadoop environment to cloud AWS and Azure, both alike, uh, using Databricks as the underlying Spark engine and the Delta Lake as their final enterprise data store. Having said that, Streamantics also sits on your on-prem environment as well as your cloud or in a hybrid fashion. We provide support for all the popular cloud vendors, AWS, Azure, or Google, as well as on-prem. We can deploy it with Horton, Cloudera, or MapR, and even CDP going forward. 
let's come to the main topic of the webinar, the migration approach. As many of you also mentioned in the poll, the time and effort is one of the major concerns. 87% of you say that's one of the major concerns for migrating your workloads onto the cloud. And we totally understand and recognize that need. Hence, what we have done is we have built an automated migration capability that lets you migrate your workloads onto the cloud in a seamless fashion. And as part of this migration, it's not just migrating the ETL workload or the logic itself, but we can also help you migrate your data to a more modern uh, data store on the cloud, for instance, Delta Lake. So if you are using, let's say, HDFS or Hive on your on-prem system as your current data warehouse or data lake systems, uh, you can move on to the Delta Lake on the cloud, and we would help you seamlessly migrate through that entire journey in an automated fashion. So what we see here on this particular slide is on your left side, in your current infrastructure, you would have on-prem all these traditional ETL tools that you're using, like Informatica or Ab Initio. Uh, what we do is we export all of those uh, meta information about your existing workloads onto XML files, which you could place into a folder. Our migration utility would go ahead, pick those up, convert those into a graphical visual Spark workload that is now available automatically onto Streamantics. And once it's available on Streamantics, you can deploy all of those on Databricks and execute them at scale. So in essence, all your existing on-prem workloads running on traditional ETL uh, tools can be taken now onto Spark on the cloud, and yet at the same time provide you with the same visual experience that you are so used to uh, with your on-prem systems. To summarize, here's a before and an after view of that entire migration journey. On the left side is the before state, that is your current state, where you have your databases, mainframe file systems, SFT locations, all these different sources on your on-prem infrastructure from where you are reading your data. You are uh, streaming or doing batch workloads on your existing traditional ETL tools and landing the data onto uh, the on-prem Hadoop. Could be HDFS file systems or it could be Hive tables. As part of the migration journey, uh, the picture on the right side shows you what your target state would look like, something in the order where all your existing sources remain as is, and we install an agent which is now able to capture all that information and push it onto the cloud, and your data processing itself happens on the cloud using a graphical visual interface, leveraging the Databricks Spark underneath as its processing engine, and the target store now becoming Delta Lake. So instead of writing into HDFS or Hive, it could be Delta Lake or any other enterprise uh, file system like S3 if you're an AWS or uh, file storage or blob storage if you're on Azure. To make it a little real, here's a summary of an existing uh, case study that we did for one of our retail customers. This was again in partnership with um, Databricks out here. Uh, the customer had about 1,400 Informatica graphs that they wanted to migrate uh, to AWS. So uh, Databricks was the uh, runtime Spark provider, and S3 was the data store. Uh, as part of this entire engagement, uh, we did the automated migration, and we reached to a level of 78% automation. Uh, by this, what we mean is, of all those 1,400 graphs, on an average, every graph, each of those 1,400 graphs were migrated 78% accurately as is onto Stream Analytics, giving you a very similar one-is-to-one -one mapping on the visual interface of Streamantics. Also, as part of the entire engagement, uh, production deployment was part of it, where um, validating the functional logic of those ETL workloads that were migrated, validating the data correctness, that whatever the ETL workloads were doing in terms of processing, reading the data, processing, transforming, and landing it into this uh, final enterprise store, all of that remains as is and accurate when it moves onto the cloud. So the entire functional and data validation was part of it, performance and endurance testing to make sure that these workloads still scale out, uh, they can still work in the way they are intended to and meet the SLAs that were uh, already predefined. In this entire effort overall, it turned out to be 40% cheaper than the manual effort. And by manual effort here we mean uh, engineers who are trying to recreate the same workload by handwritten Spark code uh, that would execute on the cloud. So if you have, let's say, 1,400 graphs, imagine the amount of time it would take for a team of engineers to recreate the entire thing manually and writing thousands and tens of thousands of lines of code. 
So it was 40% cheaper and 60% faster in comparison to that. And some of the other key highlights that the customer gained was not just moving out from the traditional um, ETL systems, but also getting a visually equivalent environment on the modern platform on cloud. So instead of recreating all of that manually with uh, thousands of lines of Spark code, now they ended up with having a visual interface where they could similarly keep managing their entire workloads on the cloud, just like they used to be doing it on on prems. Let's take an example as part of uh, this particular demo here. So in this demo here, uh, we have a workload that's something like this. We particularly chose a, a workload which looked reasonably complex, not something which is very easy or trivial, but something reasonably complex. So as we migrate this entire workload uh, onto Streamantics, uh, it sees something like this. Um, I apologize for the zoomed out image out here. Uh, I would recommend if you want to get to see it more closely, please zoom in a little. But in the demo, I'll actually show you the exact uh, data pipeline, and then I'll zoom in to give you a better relevance to how this looks. With that, let me jump right into the demo here. So what we are seeing here is the Stream Analytics web UI. Uh, this is the entryway or the gateway to the product itself. Um, currently, we are on the data pipeline page. We see two tiles here. Every tile represents a Spark job. Uh, both these Spark jobs have been configured to run on the Databricks cluster. Uh, what's interesting is Streamantics also lets you configure your entire Databricks cluster configuration right here on the UI itself. So you don't need to go log in into your Databricks account. We have uh, a tight integration with Databricks where we leverage the Databricks APIs to give you a visual way of managing your entire Databricks cluster right here from the Streamantics UI. You can uh, identify the size of your cluster, auto-scaling rules, and all of that as well. Now, once the data or the workload has been migrated, it appears as a particular tile here. And this is an example of that workload that I just showcased earlier that has been migrated. It's a little zoomed in, so you can see how closely it resembles to the original workload. Uh, one of the key things, let me highlight here, let me just zoom in a little more. The end target state has been replaced as delta. In the original workload, it was Hive, but here we have replaced it with delta. As part of the migration, uh, not just the functional uh, migration of all your transformation logic, but also replacing your end target store is taken care by the utility itself. So Streamantics brings in all the best practices and recommendations based on the target store that you choose. In this particular case, since it's Delta Lake that you have chosen as your target store, how do we make sure that the asset transactions remain true uh, in, term, in case of streaming data? And if you are doing batch workloads, how can you do uh, fast bulk loads onto Delta? All of that intricacies and complexities of which APIs to use and what is the best method, all that is taken care by uh, Streamantics itself. Now, something very in interesting with Streamantics is with every operator that you see here, you see an eye icon here. If I click on that eye icon, what happens is uh, the system behind the scenes is now transmitting a sample data set. And with every operator that you see here, a sample of that data set is applied. The logic of that operator is applied on the sample data set, and it shows you the U on the UI right here itself. So while you are designing your workflow, you can actually see the output right then and there without the need of creating the entire flow, submitting it to the cluster, figuring out whether the correctness of the logic is there or not based on the output that you receive. If you don't get the right output, scanning the logs and putting some debuggers and stuff like that. Instead of that, this is more like, imagine this like a visual debugger during your design phase itself. So one of the advantages with migration is once you migrate, let's say it's a one-time activity, two months later, somebody comes in, there are enhancements. A visual interface lets you modify these, manage these in a much easier way versus going through tens of thousands of lines of code and figuring out what to change, where to change, and going through the entire process of uh, retesting the whole thing from scratch. Uh, having said that, Streamandix also provides support for CI-CD integration, so you can pretty much migrate these workloads, commit them into Git, run nightly test cases against it, get results of what those uh, test results are, promote this from lower environment to higher environment using your CI environment like uh, Jenkins and so forth. Now, once you have migrated all of this, and let's say your job is running in production, some of the other features about um, 
the workload itself is getting to getting an idea of how these workloads are performing. So that's the other aspect of uh, Streamatics that lets you get an idea of your entire workload performance uh, without really building any kind of DevOps uh, capabilities. You get all of that out of the box itself. So for instance, I can pretty much figure out over the last seven days, how many times did this entire job run? What were the errors if there were any? I can look at those errors. I, if I see that there are errors, I can go to the error search. I can change my range. Let me just change it to 12 days. And I can see all those errors right here in a timeline view. I can get access to the stack trace. So what we are doing really is, as you migrate these workloads and you deploy them onto the newer environment, it's also equally important for you to have access to the DevOps-like capabilities that lets you monitor and manage these jobs in an ongoing fashion. So we capture all the errors that get generated during all these different uh, scheduled runs of the job that you may uh, have. We make it visually available. We also provide a summary view of those errors, so you can pretty much just look at the entire DAG and figure out where those errors are. For instance, there have been 10 errors while it was trying to write data into the Delta Lake. So you can get to know why those errors were. Just by looking at this particular graph here, you know which components are failing. You can click on that component and get to the more next level of details of, as to what it was. Was it a network connectivity issue? Was it a bad data type conversion issue which resulted in this error and so on and so forth? Uh, next step on the monitoring is the analyzer report. So with every run, it finds out all the different runtime metrics of your job. This helps you make your job uh, better tuned and more performant. Uh, not just that, it also offers a simulation. It gives you some idea of if you were to increase your cores, number of cores or the memory allocated or the number of executors uh, allocated to this particular job, how much reduction in the time it takes to execute the job would you uh, foresee. So this some kind of simulation with machine learning built into it gives you an idea of some recommendation also as to how you should proceed. Now, uh, with this, I'm now going to move to this next part in the webinar that is, now that you have migrated your workloads, uh, it's a one-time activity, you've done your migration, everything's running fine, you made sure it's on production, it's been running well, but how do you make sure that the data that keeps generating on your on-prem systems, let's say your transactional tables, how do you make sure that that data keeps on syncing onto the newer environment, uh, in this particular case, on the Delta Lake? Since Delta Lake supports asset transactions, uh, inserts, updates, deletes, all of that, um, it's a very, very good fit to migrate your transactional tables onto the cloud on our Del onto the Delta Lake, and that's what we're going to see in the demo in this phase. Thank you. Thank you for covering that as well, Puneet, because um, change data capture or CDC from tables onto Delta Lake is, not, is a common pattern we see in all our customers. And I'm, I'm happy we're, we're covering that as well. In many cases, there's hundreds of thousands of tables that, that need to keep moving and after the, after the migration. So glad to see that. Absolutely. It, it's a very common uh, question, Anand, that we keep getting with almost every enterprise customer who's wanting to migrate to a uh, cloud. CDC is a major challenge for them. Um, and the, one of the things that we also see is it's not just one database or one type of database. There's a series of different databases, series of different versions of those databases, each one working differently, hundreds of tables, thousands of columns inside of every table. So this is a very common uh, problem statement that we encounter. And actually, that was one of the motivation for Streamantics to build something like this, which is applications where we provide a complete visual interface like a drag and choose your meta information and behind the scenes we'll start constructing that entire change data capture pipeline for you. So for instance, right here, if you want to migrate from SQL Server to let's say uh, Delta Lake, you simply provide the connection details, you provide how you would want to do that. The system validates that everything is in place. Next, you select your source tables and databases from the SQL Server that you want to migrate. For instance, in this particular case, there are three databases. One of the table called product details has been identified as my change data capture source table from which I want to continuously monitor and keep tracking those changes and keep pushing them onto the Delta Lake. Uh, when I go next, I can see my target. The target here is the DBFS file system on which the Delta Lake is sitting. So this is where uh, we leverage the Databricks file system as the underlying uh, 
file system on which the Delta Lake tables have been mapped to. So that's what you specify. Next, you specify your column mapping. Uh, you also specify your SCD type. We support SCD type one and type two both. So you specify, do you want to capture and migrate all the columns of your source tables into your uh, Delta Lake? If that is the case, again, uh, which column maps to what? We pretty much do an auto mapping, and in case of conflicts, uh, we ask the user to resolve it. But literally all, if you observe, it's really all next, 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 providing some meta information, and that's all that we really expect from the user. Everything else pretty much uh, we take care of uh, behind the scenes. You can even schedule, do you want this to be as near real time as possible, or do you want this to be a job that's scheduled every one hour? So based on your use case, workloads, et cetera, you can make those decisions and pretty much see how that goes. Now. Once you have created that application, let's look at one of the applications that's running here. Um, you can go to the view details and it shows you all the information about all the different inserts, deletes, updates that it has been capturing over a period of time. So one of the common questions that uh, customers ask us is, how do I get a summary of how many inserts, how many updates, how many deletes have been performed over a period of time? And how is that synced up with my target store? Like, just because Semantic says your CDC pipeline is in place, how do I believe and make sure that my entire source database is in reality in sync with my target store? Because now that my target store is on the cloud, all my BI reporting needs, all my machine learning analytics is based off that. So it's extremely important for them to make sure that the accuracy and uh, the reliability of the data on the cloud is intact. So all this monitoring uh, helps them build all of that and come to um, that conclusion. Let me ask you this, Puneet, on, on the sourcing side of the CDC pipeline, do you use um, do you use JDBC or do you use the transaction logs themselves? Uh, we use transaction logs in most cases. For example, if you're doing uh, Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB, uh, MongoDB, all of these are transactional logs, which so they are completely non-intrusive. Uh, in certain cases like Oracle, we leverage LogMiner as the uh, chain data capture source. So. Depending on what your source systems are, my answer would vary, but in most cases, it's transaction logs, which is non-intrusive. Which is non-intrusive, yeah. yeah. So now, with this, uh, I come to an end of my demo. Uh, let me quickly go back to the slide here. So what we saw, let me just recap, what we saw in the demo so far was how you can migrate your workloads and what advantages or benefits the Streamantics provide to you in that entire journey. It provides an automated migration capability. It helps you move to a much more modern platform like Spark, uh, which is powered by Databricks on AWS and Azure. It provides a self-service easy and a very uh, intuitive visual interface. So for people who are so used to having uh, their ETL workloads on a visual interface on-prem with these legacy systems, they typically want an equivalent version of it on the cloud on the modern system as well, because nobody likes to sniff through 10,000 and 20,000 lines of code to just figure out where the change needs to be made. So self-service, a visual interface, and also at the same time, it's future proof. Uh, mostly these workloads are batch in nature, but once you move on to a more modern platform, uh, real-time streaming becomes a necessity, it's just inevitable that you now want to start streaming your data in real-time and do a lot of analytics and actionable insights of it. So Semantics helps you build uh, those two. And of course, the machine learning and the data science aspect of it, where we leverage the ML flow and the entire underlying Databricks platform for that. And uh, the other key advantage I'm looking at for, for our customers is that you're you're not only now migrating, using this tool to migrate data and workload over to Databricks Delta, but the ongoing life cycle of using Databricks and, and Delta Lake underneath becomes easy and productive as they, as they were used to. So they could continue sure. to build more pipelines, more workflows, Absolutely. and ongoingly just have this as a tool that they can use. It's not just a, a migration One, proposition, yeah. right? Absolutely. So uh, we see massive productivity gain with uh, customers using stream analytics. Uh, and as you rightly said, it's not just a, uh, migration tool where you just migrate everything off once and keep handling or working on that. This particular slide here at a glance just showcases all the different aspects of uh, Streamantics, what it is capable of doing. So ETL is obviously one of the low hanging fruits where um, 70 to 80% of the use cases require ETL. Even data science applications require ETL as part of your 
pre-processing data, prepping data, wrangling before you can even feed that data back into your machine learning. So you can ongoingly use Streamatics to build your newer use cases as and when they keep emerging from your business. Great. Um, audience members, please keep sending your questions. We are seeing a couple of questions that are coming in. Uh, but here we pretty much pause our uh, webinar content delivery, and uh, we'll start taking up questions very soon. Thank you, Puneet, for that very comprehensive run-through of all of the breadth and depth of the automation capabilities offered by the combination of Stream Analytics and Databricks. You should be seeing on your screen right now uh, our final poll question. In addition, this is a great time to enter any final questions you may have, and we'll be opening that discussion of those questions here uh, momentarily. And the question that, as you see it on your screen, would you be interested in a deep dive of the products as shown in the webinar today? Uh, ask for your feedback against that poll. In addition, we have a feedback mechanism which helps us to take a look at the user experience that you had today. We look very specifically at each of the remarks and things coming through to enhance the future user experience of our webinar audiences. And we will now also move to uh, our Q&A. Uh, we have a number of uh, questions that have come in, and the first one says, do you have support for other data lake technologies like Snowflake? And if one of our panelists could please uh, take that one. Sure. So, yeah, we do support a wide range of uh, enterprise data stores. Snowflake, is, of course, is one of them. Delta Lake is another. Uh, we also support uh, Redshift if you are on AWS. Uh, in general, Streamatic supports more than 50 different uh, connectors on the cloud and on-prem to connect and read and write data to different enterprise stores. Excellent. Let me take Thank you. One, uh, let me take one question. I'm seeing as well. The, you've shown an ETL migration here, but what about the data itself and other jobs and workloads? A uh, great question. Uh, we we called this my we called this uh, webinar Hadoop migration, and we said, look, the, around the Hadoop cluster, there's going to be ETL tools, and we we showed the uh, migration here. But yes, the Stream Analytics tool, for example, would would help to bring in your yep. data uh, data from your HDFS over to to the cloud on Stream Analytics on, on uh, Databricks and Delta. And uh, there's a number of there's you know, from, from a database perspective, we're working with, uh, with Impetus and the other partners as well. We, we focus on bringing, migrating your entire data and workloads over to, to Databricks, uh, to Databricks and, and Delta, and of course, and that, is, you know, you can handle the stream analytics part of the question for me. Sure, um, absolutely. So ETL workload migration is one part of it. Um, we can also uh, bring your data onto the cloud. Uh, that's another aspect of it. And uh, you can also leverage semantics to build uh, applications purely from scratch. So you saw CDC during the demo. So if you have CDC needs, you can use Streamatics. Uh, CDC does not necessarily, again, have to be on the cloud. It could be on-prem as well, uh, doing SQL Server or, let's say, Postgres or um, Oracle to on-prem Hadoop Hive. Even that's another potential use case that we uh, do for our customers. So. ETL, real-time streaming, machine learning, CDC, these are all different patterns, as we call them, that you can pretty much leverage uh, Streamantix for in a visual way without really worrying about the underlying technologies. Ex excellent. Uh, we do have a few more minutes here. We've got uh, more questions than we can probably handle here uh, right now. But uh, one question is, how do we validate whether our transformed workloads are error-free? Is there a way to provide validation? And Pune, Absolutely. maybe you want to step so, up and address that one. Absolutely. Uh, there is uh, data validation built into the platform. Um, we look at your source and target on the uh, pre-migration system. So whatever your existing ETL workloads are, we look at the source and the target of how the data transformation happens. We take a sample of that. And once we do the entire migration, we have the capability of doing a pure data validation uh, through Streamatics itself. So what we do is we look at the target tables on both sides. We do a shallow comparison, which is pretty much a very simplistic view. Uh, just do a record count on both sides. If it matches, that's great. That's a very shallow but a super fast thing because if the record counts don't match, you obviously know your migration didn't go through correctly. Uh, after that, we also provide more deeper uh, data validations where we pick up 
data characteristics from both the target tables on the one that was in the original system and the one that was post migration, uh, the target system. We pick up data characteristics from both sides and do a complete uh, data checks on that. For instance, if it's a number column, we do the min, max, average, standard deviation, all these different data characteristics of those target columns uh, on both sides and do a comparison. So if there is any deviation, if there was any flaw in the logic of the migration, those data characteristics would not match and it would show up immediately. And uh, thereafter, we have utilities that lets you deep dive and figure out what went wrong, what are the differences in the columns, the data elements, and thereby the uh, logic in the ETL that didn't migrate correctly. Excellent. Well, listen, thank you, Anand and Puneet both, and thank you to our audience. We are out of time. If you had questions that we did not answer here live, as I mentioned earlier, we will send those out via email. You will have a few minutes here that the uh, feedback mechanism will still be open, as well as the poll there about having interest in a deep dive of any of the products that you've seen today. But beyond that, uh, wishing you all a great uh, afternoon or evening, and thank you so much for participating. This will conclude the formal portion of our webinar today. Thank you again for attending.